So our second session today is on thoracic outlet syndrome. So what is thoracic outlet syndrome or TOS? Uh, TOS is a disorder involving compression of one or more of the neurovascular structures, which includes the nerves and blood vessels as they pass through the thoracic outlet, which is the passageway from the lower neck to the armpit. And some of the consequences of compression uh, of nerves in this area can be an interruption of nerve signaling, which has various effects, including pain and paresthesia, while compression of blood vessels can affect blood flow to the limb. Now, TOS has several causes and commonly develops as a result of functional activities, which can include chronic or prolonged movements with elevated arms or persistent static postures of the head, neck, and shoulder region. So anatomically, the thoracic outlet is comprised of three separate compartments, which together form the passageway from the neck to the armpit. So the first compartment is called the interscalene triangle. And this compartment is where the nerves of the brachial plexus, as well as the subclavian artery, pass through the middle and anterior scalene muscles and above the first rib. The second compartment is called the costoclavicular space, and this is where the brachial plexus, as well as both the subclavian artery and vein, pass between the first rib and clavicle, so underneath the clavicle and above the first rib. And the third compartment is called the pectoralis minor space or retropectoral space. And this compartment is where all three neurovascular structures pass behind the pectoralis minor muscle. And you can see in the image the origin of the pectoralis minor muscle on the coracoid process of the scapula. Uh, and this serves as the superior border to the compartment, while the muscle on the anterior of the scapula, the subscapularis muscle, serves as a posterior border. Now, uh, there's three main types of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. The first being neurogenic, which can account for up to 80% of carpal tunnel cases. Venous, which accounts for about 20% of carpal or thoracic outlet claims and uh, arterial, which accounts for less than 1%. Now, venous uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, as I said, accounts for 20% of the cases. It occurs within the costoclavicular space, and it's often caused by elevated or overarm use. And the main health effect we see is impeded circulation or oxygen nutrient deprivation. Arterial T TOS accounts for less than 1%. It occurs within the interscaling triangle, and is often caused by structural abnormalities, such as being born with an extra rib. The main health effects we see are ischemia and the possibly development of an embolism. Now, again, neurogenic TOS accounts for 80% of the cases, and it actually occurs in all three sites the interscalian, the clavicular, and the pectoralis minor. The causes vary, and we're going to go into that in much more detail. And the main health effects are pain, numbness, tingling, and cold sensation. Now, with neurogenic TOS, the symptoms can range from the neck and shoulder to the forearm and the hand. It all depends on where the the impingement is actually occur, uh, occurring. So what do we end up seeing happening is what's called the brachial plexus. And this means from the C5 to T1 levels of the spine, there's nerves that are coming off of the spinal cord and feeding into the shoulder area. Now impingement can happen either at the interscaling the costoclavicular, or the pe uh, pectoralis, and where that impingement is occurring actually determines which nerve is being affected 
and where the symptoms can actually begin to get experienced. Now the symptoms of cells, they follow a specific dermatome depending on which nerve itself is actually being compressed. So in this example, we have the muscle scleritis, then the axillary, median, radial, and ulnar. Uh, TOS most commonly affects the whole hand. And as I said, it depends exactly where the actual compression is taking place. Now, symptoms of TOS can often manifest themselves similar to carpal tunnel syndrome if the median nerve is compressed. Kayla, can you just go back one slide for a second? So, for example, if you look at the median nerve, this is the nerve that's being compressed during carpal tunnel syndrome. The symptoms, if the median nerve is being compressed due to the thoracic outlet, are the identical symptoms. So when I was asked uh, previously, uh, does it rectify itself? Well, it all depends on the testing that, uh, that was being done for the carpal tunnel syndrome. I've often seen times where when they've done the EMG testing, electrodes are only placed at the wrist, not at the elbow and the wrist. So when they do that nerve conduction test, they're only testing at one site, they're gonna say, oh yeah, you've got a latency. But if they test at both the elbow and the wrist, if you're slow at the wrist and normal at the elbow, that's going to more likely to be carpal tunnel syndrome. But if you're slow at the elbow and slow at the wrist, that's more a sign you're being impinged further up the actual uh, nerve and could be more likely a chance of developing thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, thank you, Caleb. Okay. Um, so the diagnosis of TOS includes a thorough evaluation of symptoms and symptom characteristics, uh, such as the type and especially the location of symptoms, as Trevor mentioned, and should also involve a comprehensive clinical history of when and how the symptoms began. So the evaluation should be multidisciplinary and include occupational demands and postures. And it should also be evaluated whether symptoms are reproduced in certain provocative postures that involve elevated arm positions or repetitious hand arm use, such as the elevated arm stress test or ease test, which is pictured on the slide. And this test involves abducting the arms to 90 degrees with the elbows flexed to 90 degrees and repetitively opening and closing the hands for a period of 60 to 90 seconds. And the test is considered positive if uh, symptoms are reproduced. So the first objective diagnostic criteria for neurogenic TOS was developed in 2013 by the Consortium for Outcomes Research and Education of Thoracic Outlet Syndrome, or CORE TOS, which is a consortium of more than 30 clinicians and scientists that represent a spectrum of specialties uh, and involved a thorough evaluation and ranking of over 200 clinical features considered to be pen potentially important for the diagnosis of neurogenic TOS. And the end result was this list of diagnostic criteria. So one of the reasons that having a set of diagnostic criteria is so important for a disorder like TOS is that there are many other disorders that present with similar symptoms. And these include the other peripheral neuropathies of the upper extremity, such as carpal tunnel syndrome, as well as injuries such as a rotator cuff tear, because um, the range of symptoms is so wide in TOS. And a quote that really sums this up from Erdison Adesoy, who is a well-tenured hand surgeon who's published several novels or articles, sorry, on TOS. Uh, TOS may be the most underrated, overlooked, and misdiagnosed and the most important and difficult to manage peripheral nerve compression disorders in the upper extremity. So there are three main causes of neurogenic TOS identified in the literature, which include the onset of symptoms following an acute traumatic event or post-traumatically due to structural abnormalities, which could be congenital as in you're born with them, or slight normal variations in anatomy, 
as well as work-related or functional causes. And the reason why I've put and or in between each point is just to highlight the fact that they're not mutually exclusive and can and often do contribute together. For example, those that have congenital or structural abnormalities often don't even know that they're present unless some sort of inciting event, such as an acute accident or chronic stress, causes them to become symptomatic. So post-traumatic onset is in reference to an acute trauma, such as an event that causes a fracture to the clavicle or first rib, or an event such as a car accident or a fall that causes a whiplash type injury involving rapid hyperextension and hyperflexion of the neck. And this type of injury can damage the muscles and tissues bordering the thoracic outlet and cause compression as a result of the injury and healing process. And we'll be discussing more details about how this might lead to TOS in the coming discussion on the WYSIAT paper. So anatomical and congenital factors are predisposing for TOS because they occupy additional space within the thoracic outlet, which can compress or stretch the neurovascular structures. Uh, and as previously mentioned, it's agreed upon that the large majority of these abnormalities remain asymptomatic until some activity or event incites additional narrowing or contact within the space, such as functional activities, posture of the cervical and brachial regions, or a trauma to the cervical region, uh, which in case they become a causative factor. And muscular and fibrous abnormalities are implicated in TOS more commonly than bone abnormalities. And this is thought to be because they occur much more frequently in the general population. So for example, only around 1% of the population uh, might be living with a cervical rib, but up to 30% may have a narrower than what's considered average interscalene triangle. And in one interesting study that specifically looked at the interscalene triangle spaces, only 10% had bilaterally normal anatomy, suggesting that the anatomical abnormalities that are commonly implicated in TOS are in fact just quite common in general. So the third cause of TOS is from work-related and functional causes, which generally develop over time as a result of chronic and persistent movements and postures. So the figure on the left is more indicative of an acute trauma, as we previously discussed. And as you can see, an acute trauma occurs when a single applied load exceeds the level of tolerance and causes injury. While the figure on the right represents cumulative trauma, which tends to lower the structural tolerance as a result of chronic and persistent load application over the period of weeks, months, or even years to the point where the tissues become unable to sustain what was once a normal load. Uh, one of the main components of functionally acquired causes involves prolonged or static awkward postures. And what this flow chart represents is how particular awkward postures, such as constantly working with elevated arms or a seated or standing posture, which promotes a rounded upper back and forward head posture. How these postures can lead to something called muscle imbalance, which can in turn influence compression within the thoracic outlet. So the muscular adaptations that occur as a result of these static and prolonged postures can affect lengthening and shortening of particular muscle groups, which can lead to muscle weaknesses requiring overuse of other muscles to compensate. And these adaptations can put an individual at a biomechanical susceptibility to nerve compression. And this slide is a visual representation of the awkward postures associated with the TOS. So elevating the arms for an extended period of time, such as in the image on the top left, is thought to involve direct impingement and traction of structures. Uh, and over time, the muscular adaptations to extensive overhead arm use may also result in growth of muscles surrounding the thoracic outlet, such as the scalene muscles, uh, which can worsen compression. And the image on the top right is demonstrating abduction or raising the arm away from the body, which causes the neurovascular bundle to be stretched underneath the coracoid process. Um, and it 
almost resembles a belt being stretched around a pulley. And the bottom two images depict the thoracic kyphotic or rounded back, forward shoulder, and forward head posture. And chronic or persistent adoption of this type of posture can lead to muscular adaptations and biomechanical changes, which diminish space in the thoracic outlet compartments and increase susceptibility to TOS. And this is a slight aside from neurogenic TOS regarding the pathophysiology of venous TOS as a result of elevated arm movement. So these researchers recognize the development of venous TOS as a chronic process due to continuous injury and healing of the subclavian vein during arm elevation. So in particular, persistent pinching of the vein between the clavicle and the first rib, which occurs with overhead arm movements, leads to venous injury, uh, fibrosis and scar tissue development, which can progress to full obstruction of the vein. And collateral blood vessel formation may be su sufficient to prevent symptoms. However, these vessels can become occluded uh, or, or due to clotting or continued arm, overhead arm use. And this would result in the symptoms of venous TOS. And externally applied forces to the shoulders that induce a sagging shoulder posture are also associated with worsening the symptoms of TOS. So activities that compress or depress the shoulder and push the clavicle towards the first rib, such as carrying a heavy mailbag or a load of lumber on your shoulder, as well as carrying or pulling loads with outstretched arms, like a heavy load of firewood or pulling a heavy pallet. Um, Non-surgical or conservative treatment is attempted and pursued in a, as many cases of TOS as possible. This includes physiotherapy to improve postural alignment, correct muscle imbalances, uh, coupled with occupational therapy or ergonomic intervention to educate the patient uh, and correct or eliminate risk factors relating to the workplace, such as addressing postures, repetitive movements, and high forces. And in severe cases, surgery may be required to relieve the compression on the neurovascular structures. And this generally includes removal of an extra rib or the first rib and releasing muscles or fibrous tissues that are contributing to compression, such as the scalene muscles. Thanks, Caleb. Now, uh, we're now going to switch focus on to uh, talking about the WSIAT discussion paper on thoracic syndrome. In Ontario, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal, or WSIAT, is the final level of appeal to which a worker or employer may bring a dispute concerning a work-related compensation claim. WSIAT has prepared a series of medical discussion papers to make information about medical issues that commonly arise in the appeals process easily available to parties, representatives, and adjudicators. However, this general medical information is also often being used to deny a workers' compensation claim, despite inherent errors that we're going to demonstrate today. So to begin with, the WSIAP paper states that the NDPs are intended to provide a balanced, broad, and general overview of a medical topic that can be understood by individuals that are not medical professionals. However, this is often not the case. Many of these papers are overly technical, contain obvious author bias, are based on the opinion of a single author, and are not peer reviewed. Instead, a suggestion would be using a multidisciplinary approach with a combination of professionals with respect to occupational health, such as ergonomics, occupational nursing, occupational hygiene, as well as occupational physicians that would act to prevent a single author bias and allow for alternative professional opinions with theories regarding the disease or the disorder etiology to provide a more well-balanced document. Uh, the NDP also states that each paper is written by a well-qualified professional who has been selected by WSIAT based on his or her specific expertise. It's interesting to note that the principal author 
of the original NDP uh, TOS paper does not have any publications at all on Tarascalis syndrome. The selection of the medical professional who reviewed the document in 2011, how he, this person was selected is also unclear, especially when their principal interest was of clinical research expertise focused on head injury, cerebrovascular surgery, skull-based tumor surgery, and intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring. Once again, no relevant publications on thoracic outlet syndrome. Wisniewski also states that the papers are based on current medical knowledge available at the time of writing. The NDP are not, however, intended to be the most up-to-date authority on a medical issue or topic and are not peer-reviewed. Well, when the NDP was originally written, uh, they cited six references. At the time, there were 18 articles uh, written that were deemed excellent based on reviews of other authors uh, at the time of that it was written. Uh, between 2000 and 2011, uh, the period in which the article was actually being reviewed over, there were 40 high quality articles written on the work relatedness. That once again, when the document was reviewed in 2011, it was stated that there's nothing wrong and it should stand as is. And from 2011 to present, there were another 54 excellent articles that were created uh, on the work relatedness of thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, so the medical discussion paper in its description of the anatomy of the thoracic outlet identifies the thoracic outlet solely as the interscalene triangle compartment and omits the costoclavicular space as well as the pectoralis minor space. And we know the impingement of components of the neurovascular bundle can occur at each of these three compartments. And all three compartments are now widely recognized to be part of the anatomical region known as the thoracic outlet. Uh, this might seem trivial at first, however, it, it is significant because if pathology arises independent of the interscalene triangle, which it often can, then according to the WISIAT document, the condition is not considered TOS and therefore should not be the condition of pursuit for entitlement. So the medical discussion paper also classifies neurogenic TOS into the terms true and disputed TOS. And these terms were originally used to describe the symptoms of patients and whether they display definitive results on certain tests. So true neurogenic TOS is a reference to patients with symptoms of neurogenic TOS in which there is also the presence of abnormal electrodiagnostic test results as well as abnormal motor findings in the hand muscles, such as weakness or muscle atrophy. And disputed neurogenic TOS refers to the same symptoms. However, there is an absence of abnormal electrodiagnostic test results or motor findings. Um, patients that are classified under the disputed moniker were generally those whose symptoms arose from functional causes while true cases were almost always accompanied by some sort of anatomical abnormality that directly accounted for the compression in the thoracic outlet, such as a cervical rib. Uh, what the paper fails to consider is the stages of severity in accordance with the length and degree of compression. So several studies have shown that the pathology of chronic nerve compression spans a broad spectrum of progressive changes in the nerve at the microscopic level. And it's shown that the symptoms of genuine hand weakness and muscle atrophy occur only with severe nerve compression. And it's suggested that many electrodiagnostic tests may only be abnormal in these advanced cases. So these classifications are dangerous for the paper to advocate because ignoring or disregarding patients that don't yet display these objective signs are more likely to progress to more severe or even irreversible stages of the condition. So the author that coined the terms true and disputed TOS was a skeptic of the disputed condition's existence since there were no definitive tests to prove it. 
So we've included a small excerpt from a paper written by two vascular surgeons on the subject of TOS. And they stated, um, not believing that a condition exists because a test is negative is an example of the myopic approach taken by some physicians who do not believe it exists unless one can see it on a radiograph. Unfortunately, there are many who believe the most common type of neurogenic TOS does not even exist because they cannot see or measure it. That reasoning is akin to believing that the atom did not exist until the 20th century or that the presence of a palpable pulse rules out claudication. So the medical discussion paper also states that only the lowest portion of the brachial plexus or the C8 and T1 spinal nerve roots is affected by TOS. However, according to research that was available even prior to the publication of the medical discussion paper, the upper plexus or the entire brachial plexus may be affected by the condition. In these studies, approximately one third of the cases that were seen were not limited to the lower plexus and involved either the upper plexus alone or a combination of both upper and lower plexus. So although upper plexus involvement is less frequent, it certainly is irresponsible to dismiss its involvement in TOS And to build off the previous slide, when describing the symptoms of neurogenic TOS, the medical discussion paper limits the sensation of pain and paresthesia to an ulnar nerve distribution. And this is reflective of the claim that only the lower portion of the brachial plexus is involved. However, when researching for a clinical perspective on this claim, most publications from clinicians that specify in the disorder describe symptoms that extend beyond an ulnar nerve distribution and most often include symptoms that involve other fingers or the entire hand. And this would suggest that the distribution of symptoms is dependent on the location of the brachial plexus that is being compressed and should not disqualify the condition from being TOS if the pattern of symptoms doesn't follow a specific distribution. Another major flaw of the medical discussion paper is its description of venous and arterial TOS. The paper states vascular TOS with symptoms due to involvement of the subclavian artery is extremely rare. Obstruction of the subclavian vein is not part of thoracic outlet syndrome. So the author does not consider venous TOS to be a subtype of TOS. And this likely stems from the paper's recognition of the interscalene triangle as the sole compartment associated with TOS. Since the subclavian vein doesn't pass through this compartment, it's omitted as a subtype of TOS. And this is obviously a dangerous component of the paper as venous TOS often becomes symptomatic due to chronic mechanical trauma from overhead arm exertion and is considered to be a widely recognized subtype of TOS. Uh, it should also be noted that the term vascular TOS has largely been abandoned from use because it doesn't distinguish between arterial and venous TOS, which are both vascular, but considered to be clinically distinct entities. So moving on to the paper's review of the causes of TOS, the paper makes a damaging statement towards work-related and functional causes of TOS by calling etiology in this manner both speculative and controversial. Specifically, the paper states whether or how much the thoracic outlet can be narrowed by swelling or overgrowth of the scalene muscles or by swelling of adjacent ligaments or other tissues due to excessive wear and tear, repetitive awkward or overhead movements, or by a sudden straining injury remains speculative and controversial. And this statement has proven to be damaging in several WSIAT appeals cases, as this quote has been directly used as evidence in the denial of benefits for TOS claims. And five of these decisions we've listed in the references. So part of what the paper classifies as speculative and controversial 
is TOS as a result of an acute injury. As we previously discussed, this can include whiplash from an automobile accident. It can include slips and falls or other work-related injuries involving the hyperflexion, hyperextension of the neck, which can cause damage to the tissues and muscles. Uh, we discovered several studies uh, which implicated and described the mechanisms by which acute trauma to the neck tissue and surrounding muscles can cause both acute symptoms through the hemorrhage and swelling in the injured muscle tissue that follows the injury, as well as chronic symptoms as a result of fibrosis and scarring of the muscles and tissues surrounding the thoracic outlet. And this causes muscles such as the scalenes to become shorter and stiffer. And since normally the nerves of the brachial plexus are in contact with the scalene muscles, this causes compression and traction, which is usually worsened with hand and arm activities. And another of the functional causes that is deemed speculative and controversial by the discussion paper is the role of awkward posture in the development of TOS, which as we discussed previously, falls into the main components of head, neck, and shoulder posture, and chronic or persistent activities with the arms elevated. So there was quite a large body of literature implicating the posture of the head, neck, and shoulder area and the progressive development of TOS, particularly through the development of muscle imbalance, which is characterized by overuse and posture-induced weakness in some muscles and tightness of others. So the posture that was most commonly observed in flexor-dominated occupations was a pattern of the rounded upper back, rounded or sagging shoulders, and forward head posture. And in a 2001 study, this posture was identified as a main commonality between over 300 subjects with a diagnosis of neurogenic TOS. And these researchers suggested that the chronic adoption of this posture results in adaptive shortening of the scalene muscles and diminishing of the compartment spaces, which causes compression on the brachial plexus. And in regards to the elevated arm posture and overhead movement, it's thought that these activities, when done consistently for prolonged periods of time, can directly impinge the structures and cause sort of attractive injury as the neurovascular bundle is stretched under the coracoid process. An example of this is TOS among athletes, which quite commonly occur in sports such as baseball and rowing, in which athletes exert force with an elevated or abducted arm. And it's quite easy to see how this might translate to a work environment, such as the chronic use of heavy tools overhead or with an elevated arm. And it's also thought that muscle imbalances can occur as a result of improper techniques and muscle utilization when performing these activities. And this really highlights that these awkward postures are not independent of one another and often influence each other or occur simultaneously. Oh, and uh, another one is uh, for the final uh, risk factors is compression. Now, it's generally applied forces to the shoulders that induce a sagging shoulder posture are typically associated with the worsening of the symptoms. So any activity that depresses the shoulder girdle, including carrying a heavy bag on one shoulder, uh, such as like a mail carrier, for example, these all act to push the clavicle down towards the first rib. They're gonna increase the compression. Also carrying heavy loads on the shoulder, such as uh, an example of carrying the lumber, uh, as well as holding a load in outstretched arms. These all act uh, in a compression inducing way to narrow the actual space within the thoracic outlet itself. Now, with respect to clinical presentation, the discussion paper refers to the symptoms of muscle weakness in disputed neurogenic TOS as subjective or voluntary. Due to the absence of accompanying muscle atrophy or electrodiagnostic abnormality. Now, Thompson last year uh, published a paper that stated Pain associated with the affected extremity may lead to the perception of weakness, which is a frequent component of neurogenic TOS patients. But genuine hand weakness is a sign of late stage development and is only present in a small number of cases. 
and in identifying the disorder as true, only when presented with later stage symptoms uh, can be dangerous to a patient's health and undermines the dispute, uh, dispute of patient's condition. The discussion paper makes no effort to validate the patient's symptoms, instead displays skepticism. Uh, with respect to diagnosis, the paper states there's no clear diagnostic criteria or standards for thoracic outlet syndrome. Well, in the time that this paper was written, there's been several advancements in the diagnostic approach to thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, therefore, the statement is no longer considered to be valid. For example, uh, CORD TOS developed a diagnostic criteria in 2013 and has been validated uh, by Baldwin et al. in 2017. The Society for Vascular Surgery published a set of reporting standards, including a slightly more streamlined set of diagnostic criteria for each subtype of thoracic outlet syndrome in 2016. The discussion paper advocates for also for certain diagnostic tests, which have actually fallen out of favor uh, since it was written, and against the use of testing methods that have since undergone advancements and are being recognized as sort of the gold standard of where uh, these testings should actually be done and how they're used. Uh, with respect to electrodiagnostic tests, uh, it's used to confirm the presence of nerve compression by demonstrating abnormalities to the conduction of the affected nerve, very similar to the example I gave during the carpal tunnel presentation. The paper advocates uh, this test potential utility to demonstrate the presence of true neurological TOS but assumes that the position that the electrodiagnostic abnormalities are inconsistent and testing was unreliable for dis uh, disputed neurogenic TOS. Neither CORE or SBS diagnostic criteria deem the presence of electrodiagnostic abnormalities a necessary component for the actual diagnosis of neurogenic TOS. The lack of EMG and NCD evidence in neurological TS can actually be attributed to intermittent or the dynamic nature of the compression that's happening, and the difficulty in isolating the brachial plexus nerves for evaluation. As we know, there's five nerves that are coming off that uh, from the neck that can actually be compressed. Uh, it's suggested that nerve damage necessary to produce the electrodiagnostic abnormality are only present in advanced stage cases of TOS. And uh, the paper also suggests using something called N-wave testing but research has found no statistical difference between controls and neurogenic TOS patients in terms of the F wave latency. With respect to venography, the paper states venography is the injection of a radio contrast material into an arm vein followed by X rays and only of value of the diagnosis of this very rare condition, effort thrombosis of the subclavian vein, and not the diagnosis of TOS. Well, you have to remember the NDP does not consider venous TOS to be a subtype of thoracic outlet syndrome, stating venography is no longer considered to be of any value in the diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome. In a modern era where venous, venous TOS is widely accepted as a subtype of thoracic outlet syndrome, the inclusion of this information in the WSIAT document is misleading and potentially harmful. Venography is one of the three imaging modalities recommended by SBS and required for the diagnosis of venous thoracic outlet syndrome. Computer uh, tomographic and mag magnetic resonance venography are also widely cited for their usefulness and accuracy for identifying and evaluating the venous thoracic outlet syndrome. So the medical discussion paper also condemns the use of ultrasound and plethysmography in the diagnosis of TOS, stating that most experts find the tests of little value. Plethysmography, which is a tool for measuring changes in volume in different areas of the body, was cited numerous times in recent literature as a tool that was used alongside ultrasound to evaluate patients with suspected venous or arterial TOS. Now, these are not definitive diagnostic techniques, but they are used in conjunction with more stringent measures, such as venography or arteriography, to support diagnoses. 
and improvements to the digitalization of these techniques have made them more reliable. So both of these testing modalities are considered clinically relevant as components of more thorough diagnostic criteria and should not be negated by the medical discussion paper. Uh, finally, I wanted to highlight a comment made in the medical discussion paper, which states that tenderness on pressing over the thoracic outlet above the clavicle, production of pain or numbness in the arm and hand with supraclavicular pressure have not been shown to have any consistent reliability or validity in the diagnosis of TOS. As we previously discussed, the core TOS was a panel of several clinicians, surgeons, and experts in the field who were tasked with establishing the diagnostic criteria for neurogenic TOS. And according to the group, out of over 100 items to be ranked for importance in establishing a clinical diagnosis of neurogenic TOS, local tenderness or pain on palpation in the area of the scalene triangle and hand or finger paresthesia following palpation of the scalene triangle were ranked first and second in importance. So in conclusion of our review of the medical discussion paper, so the paper demonstrates uh, its outdatedness by stating there are no clear diagnostic criteria or standards for TOS, which has changed as of 2013 following the development of the core TOS criteria, as well as the SVS standards in 2016. In addition, the paper fails to acknowledge the entire anatomy associated with the disorder which results in its failure to even recognize one of the subtypes of the disorder, venous TOS. Uh, the paper also consistently uses biased and largely abandoned terms, true and disputed neurogenic TOS, which have been criticized for undermining a patient's condition. Finally, the paper does not consider a broad body of research that argues against many of its key statements, such as the distribution of symptoms, the condition's pathology, and the usefulness of certain diagnostic techniques. Perhaps most damaging is the paper's stance on the occupational or functional origin of the condition, calling the condition speculative and controversial when it arises in this manner. For a document that is being used in consideration for workers' compensation claims for TOS resulting from occupational origin, the paper makes reference to the potential functional causes of the condition in a total of three sentences in the entire 12-page document, one sentence of which was to label these origins as speculative and controversial. So for all these reasons, the use of this paper in WSIAT hearings is definitely questionable. And like the carpal tunnel syndrome, I did a review of our database on Thrat Scalet and found that uh, Almost 7% of patient referral cases to OCAL were involving thoracic syndrome. 71% of them came from manufacturing, healthcare, public administration, construction, transportation, and warehousing. Uh, the top industries, nursing care facilities, general medical surgical hospitals, municipal regional public administration, uh, manufacturing, postal service, which, I mean, consider we give the example of the mail carrier with the shoulder bag, uh, construction, elementary schools, uh, grocery store or manufacturing, and grocery store workers. 98% uh, of the occupational classifications came from manufacturing, uh, trades with transportation and equipment operators, sales and service occupations, health occupations, and natural resource, agriculture, and related occupations. Uh, the top 10 occupations with thoracic outlet syndrome were classified as other assisting occupations to support health services, material handlers, uh, janitors, custodians, assembly line workers, uh, farm workers, cleaners, and uh, truck drivers. And of course, this is just a list of the references. And included with that is also uh, links to the decisions that we mentioned, 
where the discussion paper has actually been used to deny a compensation claim, despite the fact that, as Caleb said, only a minimal amount of the paper even addresses work, the work-relatedness of the condition. And uh, we'll open up the floor to any questions. Trevor, so we got, at what degree of shoulder abduction do you normally start to see more compression on the brachial plexus? Caleb, do you want to feel that one? Um, sure. I, I don't have a specific number on that. I know that it doesn't take uh, a very high degree of arm elevation in general. Um, I think shoulder impingement um, can occur even with as little as 60 degrees of compression. Um, so just to visualize what would happen when you abduct your arm and you can kind of visualize the neurovascular structures being pulled underneath underneath of the coracoid process. Um, there's also some Im imaging work that was done that has shown that uh, at about 90 degrees of abduction or elevation of the arm, there's up to 50% reduction in the costoclavicular space. Um, so it would definitely vary based on each space and with the degree of, of elevation. Good. And there's a similar question about shoulder flexion, so I think it would be a similar answer there. And so when doing an initial survey to evaluate workers' complaints of symptoms such as finger tingling and sharp pain, is there a tiered approach to evaluating the causes of pain? So sometimes there is a tendency to advise a person to correct their posture and use an appropriate ergonomic workstation design, but that could only be a short-term short solution that does not really solve the issue. On the other hand, medical diagnosis may not be necessary. So is there a tiered approach to evaluating? I mean, to me, it's kind of follows the whole common sense thing. Uh, it, you know, if it's something you wake up and you got a little bit of a discomfort, but then the next day it's gone and never occurs again, then, you know, it's not, it's probably just the way you slept, for example. Uh, when it starts to persist, that's when you need to start looking at it. Uh, first and foremost, I you know I see nothing wrong with going to a doctor and getting uh, yourself checked out. Uh, because it's better to rule out. Because for all we know, it may not be a work relatedness. It could be an underlying condition. You may have a hyperthyroid condition or some other condi underlying condition that can affect uh, peripheral neuropathy, be it thoracic outlet syndrome or carpal tunnel syndrome. So as I said, getting tested, uh, making changes to your workplace, to me, it all goes hand in hand. It's uh, something that needs to be done. I happened to do a survey a couple of years ago on uh, custodians and a number of other occupations. And it was interesting to note that 50% of them reported to be in severe or moderate to severe pain. But of that 50%, only 25% of them ever sought medical attention. They kept working in pain. They also never reported it for modifications to be made to their work area. So as a result, so when you start experiencing discomfort, it's good to get it checked out, both from the work related aspect as well as the underlying conditions. Great, thanks. So there's another one here. Is there case law successfully deproving the assertions of the paper? Uh, to my understanding, no. Um, it should be noted though that Thrasy Gallup one has gone from their active papers to their now archived, but that doesn't mean that they're no longer in use either. Uh, they're just no longer being sought as being updated. Uh, so yeah, so there's nothing that says, you know, these are flawed, you shouldn't use them. And a lot of the times when advocates are arguing before WYSIAT, part of their main argument is trying to disprove uh, the inconsistencies within the paper, much like we've done today. And then we had a question on exoskeletons. So do you think they reduce the impact, um, the risk of TOS on the shoulder? 
No, exos the use of exoskeletons are still, and the effects are still up in the air. It's largely unknown. Um, I was actually part of a conference call last week uh, where this exact topic was brought up. And you know, the comment, comment about it was that you no know, more research and investigation needs to be done onto the true effectiveness of the exoskeletons. Uh, as I said, once again, so many things are created, made, thrown out the market without the proper research being done on them. So until uh, this more definitive research is created, uh, it's probably best not to comment on it just because everything would be circumspect. Okay, and uh, considering the paper is quite dated with the research relied on, uh, is there a push to have the NDP updated accordingly? Um, as far as I know, no. As I said, they've actually taken it from their active and moved it to their archived. Uh, and no, and this one isn't, the thoracic one isn't alone. There's carpal tunnel syndrome, alter gait, Dupuytren's contracture. There's so many conditions. And it's not just MSDs. They're also being used for uh, in, uh, in occupational disease as well. And I think the most important thing is people need to bring the inconsistencies of these papers forward in order for them to start creating a more multidisciplinary approach. As I said, like, I've seen some of these papers where it's so obvious that the author doesn't believe in the condition that they're writing the paper on. Or you no, know, in this example, where the authors didn't even have any published experience on the actual condition. So I think more of a push to update them is required, but that's gonna come at a more grassroots level. And it should be argued that it needs to be done as a multidisciplinary team in order to rule out other biases and the fact that there's other trains of thoughts on how injuries can occur. You no, know, a doctor will see it from one perspective. An ergonomist sees it from a completely different perspective. And it's the melding of those two perspectives to create a well-balanced thought process and approach that's actually should be required for these papers. Great, and uh, can neurogenic TOS go away with rest and time? Uh, once again, as I answered for the carpal tunnel syndrome, it all depends on one, underlying conditions, two, how long it's uh, been around, uh, it's been around for, as you said, you know, the pain, weakness, those symptoms uh, are in late stages. And so if someone's in a late stage, the chances are comp of complete resolution of symptoms is less likely to happen. And then uh, are there specific stretches or exercises workers can do to help with TOS? And are there some stretches or exercises that they should avoid? We kind of discussed, uh, we didn't go into too much too much depth on the conservative treatment for TOS, uh, but there has been some really positive uh, papers written about uh, the effectiveness of the uh, conservative treatment, which includes uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. Uh, so in, in terms of specifics, um, I wouldn't, uh, I probably wouldn't, um, give any advice for specific stretches or exercises, um, but they have been shown to be effective and are definitely part of treatment programs designed for thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, and uh, what is the gold standard to diagnose TOS? Well, I, I believe that the, the diagnostic criteria that was created in 2013 uh, it's also since been validated in a clinical, in a, in a study, a peer-reviewed study. Um, so the core TOS that we've been mentioning so frequently throughout this, uh, they actually, they use the clinical diagnostic criteria at the, it's the Washington University Thoracic Outlet Syndrome Center, uh, where a majority of these professionals work, and that's the criteria that they use. So. Uh, it's it is a it's a tough disease or a condition to to diagnose, but uh, the the standards and um, that have been created are definitely, I would say, the gold standard at this point.
Uh, great, thanks. So that's everything there. So back to you, Trevor. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, Caleb, thank you very much for uh, being part of this today. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone uh, who attended the event. And you no, know, please remember that we have three other sessions happening this month. Uh, session two on integrating components of a return to work program. This is a, a request we've had for a number of years. And unfortunately, part of OCAL's mandate is we don't do a return to work. And so we've actually brought in three experts uh, who are actually going to look at the three components of a return to work program, including uh, you know, what's required in a physical demands description, what's required in the functional abilities exam, and then how to link the two of them to actually implement a return to work program. Week three is looking at ergonomics for specific occupations uh, with a focus on custodians, uh, janitors, and then also carpenters. And then week four is going to look at some other uh, ergonomic prevention tools OCAL's developed. So you know, please uh, register for those events if you haven't done so yet. And also again, please complete the uh, feedback survey. Uh, it gives us the ability to not only come up with topics for other events, but we actually do seriously review it in order to find ways to actually strengthen our programs. And with that, uh, thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we'll see you all again next week.